speaker, he received his PhD from the George Washington University. Uh, I was a member of his dissertation committee, but Peter Vail was his dissertation advisor. My first reaction upon reading his dissertation was that it would likely increase conflict among the various fields within system science. The reason is that it is possible to disagree with some of the judgments about which fields emphasize which concepts. Nevertheless, I found his ideas novel, intriguing, and useful. A year ago, in a talk in Vienna, Austria, I referred to Eric's study in a lecture on the history of the cybernetics movement in the United States. In the question and answer period, most of the questions concerned Eric's work. That experience persuaded me that the basic ideas in his dissertation need to be more widely known in the systems and cybernetics community. So here he is. Present them. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Eric Benton. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. And the title for my talk this morning is The Underlying Assumptions of Several Traditions in System Science. And I've tried to put on this first slide uh, the premise of all of my remarks this morning. Now, systems approaches do share a number of philosophical assumptions that aren't widely shared by a lot of other sciences. Uh, Jackson, for example, has suggested that they all share holism as a philosophical assumption. At the same time, uh, Dr. Ubleby and I have published a paper in which we demonstrate that the major ideas of systems theories have really been developed somewhat in isolation from each other. The major leaders in these different strands of system sciences were often aware of each other, but for the most part attended different conferences and didn't otherwise engage in other collaborative efforts. Now there may be a number of reasons why this is the case. But the premise of my talk this morning is that one of the reasons could be that there were major philosophical assumptions in which these different strands of system science uh, differed, so that it was not easy for them to find common ground, and that there would be differences in philosophy among groups such as, say, operations research and, and general systems theory. Uh, Jackson has also suggested that if system science is going to continue to develop effectively and rapidly that what he's called for is that there needs to be an integration and synthesis of the underlying assumptions of the field. So what are the kinds of assumptions that I'm talking about? Uh, I've gathered long, long lists of the various philosophical assumptions on which people may take different stances, and these eight will be those that I'll refer to later in my talk that were part of a particular study. But I've gathered a whole long list of things that would include others, such as uh, assumptions about competitive or cooperative dynamics, uh, how paradox is treated here in assumptions. And in one of my papers, what I did was to do an analysis that concluded that there are three major philosophical assumptions that tend to form an individual's overall worldview. And those three have to do with observation, whether or not you assume that the, uh, that the inquirer can be objective in observation, as opposed to being uh, perspectival. And I really like that particular word because I think its connotation is that someone is, uh, has a perspective from a particular viewpoint. Uh, secondly, whether or not someone takes a holistic or a reductionist perspective. And thirdly, having to do with causality. At one end of the continuum, you might have the notion that entities can be discreetly identified and that there are direct and linear causal relationships between them. At another end, you may have a mutual causality, the assumption that you cannot discreetly uh, disentangle a cause and effect, and that if you were to draw causal arrows, that they would go in, in both directions. In another one of my papers, I distinguish between what I refer to as the traditional worldview, or TWV, and the emerging worldview, or EWV. And the traditional worldview makes the assumptions along the three constructs that I just mentioned of objective observation, reductionism, and more direct causality. The emerging worldview makes assumptions of perspectival observation and holism and mutual causality. 
But as I dug a little bit deeper into the philosophical assumptions, it seemed to me that you really couldn't describe it quite as cleanly as that. And so I then came across this notion of a polarity from Barry Johnson's work. And I think that a polarity is really the, a more accurate way to think of it. And typically, the traditional worldview assumptions emphasize, uh, sometimes almost exclusively, just one side of a polarity. Whereas the emerging worldview assumptions really recognize that there is a polarity, which is the, the definition of that is uh, a pair of interdependent opposites. So if you were to assume mutual causality, for example, it doesn't mean that you're excluding the possibility of there being um, linear relationships between variables in some localized instance. It's just that you're saying that's not the only thing that you're uh, making assumptions about pertaining to philosophy about causality. What Barry Johnson's work has suggested is that if you look at a polarity graph, which is what I have here, you see in red reductionism on the left and holism on the right. The polarity graph has the advantages of the poles listed in the upper quadrants and the disadvantages listed in the lower. And his work suggests that the best scenario is if you can keep a positive tension between uh, both poles. But that's when you're most likely to experience the benefits of both sides. But more often what happens is that we tend to emphasize one side over the other. And again, his work suggests that if you overemphasize one side, you're likely to experience the disadvantages of that side. And what happens is that people will kind of tra traverse these four quadrants in a figure eight form. So that, for example, if you started with a reductionist view, you just experience the benefits of the upper left quadrant there around uniqueness, about uh, taking care of the part, about individual autonomy and so forth. But if that was your only focus, over time, you're going to go down in that lower left quadrant and experience some of the disadvantages of that reductionist view. So you'll see that there's a neglect of the whole. And when people start to experience that dynamic, they start searching for answers and saying, ah, we should take a holistic perspective. That'll help solve these problems. So then they follow the figure eight up to the upper right-hand corner and, and they start to get the benefit of quality and synergy and so forth. But again, if you focus only on a holistic perspective for too long, you'll experience the disadvantages of that. And Johnson's work suggests that you can keep just looping around this figure eight. And where I've seen that most dramatically in my experience is in organizations that I've consulted to around organizational structure, where you could put decentralized on one pole and centralized on the other. And you have an organization that's centralized and realize that they're not dealing with the unique uh, features of certain customers and employees' creati creativity may be stifled a little bit, so some bright manager comes along and says, well, let's decentralize the structure. And they start to get the benefits that they uh, weren't getting previously. And everyone's happy for that for a while, but then they start to experience the disadvantages and probably the manager changes, changes. the next one that comes in wants to make some improvement immediately sees these disadvantages and says, ah, let's go back to, they won't even know the history perhaps, let's go to a centralized structure. And I've, I've been with some organizations in a consulting or otherwise capacity for about 20 years and seen them kind of go back and forth about every 18 months to, to two and a half years um, as they just continue to circle uh, through a, a polarity chart like that. What I'd like to share with you now is to go into a little bit more depth about the three major constructs that I mentioned. And the way that I want to do that is through a series of uh, visual images. And so this one is for uh, mutual causality. And this is a cartoon by uh, Ashley Brilliant. I think what's nice about this cartoon is it really does ask us to revisit our assumptions about cause and effect. And my guess is that if you went and asked each each of these fencers who started all this, they both say, the other one did. 